Street in a Stride Double Feature is coming out this week, so I'll be playing it on at one of my local game stores on Friday. I'm quite looking forward to it. I know the set's had a little bit of controversy around it. There's a, a few issues, which are definitely issues, but I'm going to enjoy the gameplay anyway, I think. That's an interesting thing to play, and I think the, um, the way that the two sets have been combined is going to be interesting. I uh, thought I'd put a little video together looking at some of the archetypes and things like that, but it's ended up more like a full-on primer, so I'll take you through what Innistrad Double Feature is, and then what the archetypes do, and, and which ones get better, which ones get worse, and a few other bits and pieces about the format. So, if you're not aware, D Double Feature is a combination of the last two Innistrad sets, so this is Innistrad Crimson Vow and Innistrad Midnight Hunt, and before there would be separate boosters, what we're going to do in this set is you're going to take basically both those boosters and mash them together in one and you get this one uh, Innistrad double feature booster and something I didn't realize was that the makeup of that booster is a little bit different so in normal booster you have 10 commons three uncommons and a rare and then a basic land and sometimes one of those uh, commons could be upgraded to a foil so that would be a foil common uncommon or rare so if you had a foil no matter what the rarity of the foil you would have nine commons in double feature, it's slightly different because you're going to get an even split of cards from both packs. So you're going to get eight commons, four from Crimson Vow and four from Midnight Hunt. You're going to get four uncommons, two from each set, two rares or mythics, and that's going to be one from each set. And then you also get a silver screen file. So as far as I'm aware, there's no basic lands in these packs from what I can see. Um, but you do have 15 cards that you can draft. And... Having two rares is going to increase the power level of this because you open it, you'll be, pick a rare, and then you'll be past at least one rare. Having four uncommons will also increase the power level because your commons often are cards which really make the decks. Uh, yes, okay, you want your commons and you want to be able to draft your commons, but uh, the uncommons do have a significant role to play. So having four, it'll help counteract the fact that you might not be getting those commons. So if you only had three uncommons, then because it's going to be split between the two packs, Getting those key uncommons would be more difficult, so it's still going to be slightly more difficult to get a particular uncommon in this set, but getting more on average, more of your deck will be made up from uncommons probably when you build your deck, is going to be quite good. And then having that silver screen file as a guaranteed slot at the end is another way, just it's going to slightly increase the power level of the decks, because it means you've got one more card to choose from, and that could be a an common, uncommon, rare, or mythic. So you could potentially get three uh, mythics in the set, so um, in, in a single pack. Probably unlikely, but it is something that which could happen. So I think it's important to realise this. As far as I'm aware, when you're drafting, you only take one card per pack. I know when we had double masses and things like that, you would take two cards from the first pack. But in this set, as far as I know, it's just going to be take one card from the pack. But it depends. Just double check with your local game store what's going on. Um, but I think it is just uh, taking one card from the pack. Another thing in the set is we are getting a new treatment to the cards, so we're getting the black and white treatment. Uh, I know there's some issues with how they've done this, but we are getting this black and white treatment where they've changed the colour of the cards, uh, so it is just black and white, and you can see here on the Diagraph Scavenger, the, uh, the different colours have different kind of borders around here, so you've got the purpley border for the black cards, and you would have the same for all the other cards as well, and the gold cards have a bit of a gold border. So it's, it's a pretty cool treatment, and I'm really looking forward to seeing these silver screen files. I think they might look quite good. Uh, if you're not aware, instead of the kind of rainbow filing process that they've had in the past on most cards, which works nicely with the coloured cards, it doesn't really work very well on the black and white cards, so they've done a different filing process which works better with the black and white cards that are there. So I think that's going to be really interesting. Getting in the meat of things now, let's have a look at some statistics from the previous two sets. So what we do, I'm going to go through each of the archetypes, each of the colour pairs, and have a look at the win percentages for a Premier Draft on... Uh, Magic Arena from 17 lands. So uh, we've got the 10 different color, uh, color pairs down the left hand side of the screen here. And in Midnight Hunt, you have the two big ones, the Azorius and Demir were the two top archetypes. A lot of people think Demir was, but Azorius did have a decent chunk of the uh, play against it. And then in Crimson Vow, Rakdos was the, the most, the, the strongest of the uh, archetypes. And what I've done as well is I've taken an average of these win rates and notice that they are all above 50 percent i think when i looked at um at the stats on 17 lands the 17 lands drafters tend to do slightly better at midnight hunt than it did on crimson vow uh, which is quite interesting there's about a 0.6 percent difference between the two uh, but you know you do have these about 55 percent win rate on 17 lands because the better players tend to use 17 lands it's it's just a, a matter of fact so taking the average uh there are three archetypes three or four archetypes which are 
seem to be significantly higher than the rest. You've got quite a big chunk in the middle here with not, not very much between them. And then you have the two archetypes down the bottom here, uh, which are the lower end of the uh, spectrum. So that's uh, Simic and Golgari. So you have a bit of a spread, and this doesn't tell the whole story. I'm going to go into each archetype in a little bit more detail, but this gives you a little idea of um, if we just take the average of the win rates from the two sets, then how does it work? But certain archetypes, uh, so for certain archetypes from the Crimson Vow and the Midnight Hunt will work well together, and certain ones don't work well together. So that's what I'm going to do in the next part of the video. However, as a big thank you, I did manage to hunt out my spare Crimson Vow uh, pre-release code, so if you haven't managed to um, cash in a pre-release pre code from Crimson Vow, there's one on the screen for you to use, uh, and that'll get you six packs of Crimson Vow. There's only, you can only use one per account. I do recommend going to your uh, pre-releases if you feel it's safe to, and I am actually quite looking forward to doing the pre-release for the Kamigawa Neon Dynasty that's coming up in about three weeks' time, I think. It's not very far away. I'm looking forward to doing some videos on that. Anyway, let's have a look at the archetypes in a bit more detail. We're looking at the colour pairs, and I'm going to be looking at the uh, some of the golden commons from each set. Like I did say, it's not as important looking at the, these specific cards, but it's just going to give a bit of an idea of the set. Um, because you know you, you're not as likely to get a particular one in Crimson Vow. If you're playing black green, chances are there's going to be an ancient number not opened around the table. Um, but in double feature, it's slightly less likely that you will get that specific ancient number not, but you will be getting more uncommon, so you'll be getting more gold cards in general. Also in Midnight Hunt, if you remember, there were two gold uh, uncommons for each color pair, so that is going to affect things as well. However, um, here they are. So in Crimson Vow, it was all about butts matters. It cared about toughness, and in Midnight Hunt, it cared about things dying. And these cards don't, and these two archetypes don't really have any inherent synergy with each other. There's uh, no real reason why you would have the death matter stuff going along with the toughness matter stuff. Um, so these these do seem to be even worse than the sum of the parts, and I think that's a big uh, problem. Also, the Midnight Hunt uh, archetype cared about things dying, and that worked really well with decayed tokens because you could attack with the decayed tokens and they would die. And they'll be able to, they would count as creatures dying, uh, which we won't have as many of those in the set uh, now because only half the cards will. Uh, well, the, the cards that care about the Cadle only show up about half of the time. Another big thing I think is worth pointing out is that in Crimson Vow, one of the best, if not the best, black common was Bleed Dry, and this exiles a creature. So um, it's going to not really work very well with this Death Matter stuff. And generally, I just don't think these two archetypes work very well together, so I'll probably be avoiding Black Green. Uh, although I think both archetypes are quite cool. Black Green, again, another draft uh, format where Black Green isn't working very well. Sorry, Zach and Ben uh, from Draft Chaff. I know it's it's one of your favourite archetypes to play, I think Ben in particular, but uh, this is not going to be where you're going to be playing Black Green. Next one, which uh, was also quite low down, was the uh, Gruel archetype. Sorry, Gruel. Werewolves. And this got a lot better in Crimson Vow. It wasn't very good in Midnight Hunt because of a lot of the instant speed spells, and it was quite easy to turn the werewolves off. Uh, it got better in uh, Crimson Vow, and I'm not 100% sure why. I think it was just some better cards. There was maybe less reliant on the werewolf and day-night mechanic. Um, there was didn't have the cards which turned things back to day, and I, maybe that's what it was. I'm, I haven't quite put my finger on why. Maybe it was just better quality cards. I didn't see any big reasons why the daybound nightbound worked in uh, Crimson Vow and didn't work as well in Midnight Hunt, but it did. Um, one thing to point out is in Crimson Vow we did have some good instant speed cards like a Braid, uh, like uh, was Flame Blast Bull? I can't remember what was exactly in there. But you know, you, ha you had some of these really strong cards that were in uh, instant cards at common that were in Crimson Vow. So when you're against the deck which is going to be fighting against it, it might be hard, uh, easier to flip back to day uh, and it might not matter that way. The good thing is though, these two archetypes do work together. So you know, the, the day bound, night bound stuff does work between the two archetypes. So I've got some hope for, for this archetype. I won't be avoiding it massively, but I do think, I do kind of worry that we'll be more on the Midnight Hunt side than we're on the Crimson Vow side. And in, uh, Midnight Hunt, I think, was probably the worst archetype out of all 10, whereas in Crimson Vow, it was probably in the top half. So we'll see how this one balances out. Moving on, is it? And these are going to be a little bit confusing because in Midnight Hunt it cared about casting instant and sorceries and in Crimson Vow it cared about casting non-creature spells. And it's just one of those things you would want to avoid in a set that you designed together. I think it's fine in this, it's, it's just interesting, but the 
Crimson Vow cards care about artifacts and enchantments also being cast, not just the instants and sorceries and planes of I suppose, as well. Um, but, you know, you've, you've got this uh, non-creature spell compared to instant and sorcery spell, but a lot of the time they will work together. Instant and sorceries were a key part of both of these decks, and, you know, you're going to be able to do some stuff. You might also be able to do some quite cool stuff with Thermal Alchemist at Uncommon in Midnight Hunt and the Kessic Flame Breather in Crimson Vow and have some kind of stormy, pingy deck with lots of spells, so you've got like both of these cards that can work like this. I think there's some other cards which kind of worked along this way as well. So, uh, and you've got things like Ancestral Anger. Ancestral Anger is not going to be as good as it was in Crimson Vow because you're less likely to get a, a number of these uh, cards. So, if you're looking for these uh, Collect Them All cards, a bit like Wretched Throng as well, um, you're going to be less likely to really go off. But uh, single red mana with a load of pingers for uh, give something plus X plus O and draw a card is still going to be quite good. Um, but yeah, I think I'll, if I was going down this route, I would want to be looking for some kind of pingy deck, maybe. Uh, get your Thermal Alchemists if you can, get your Cassic Flame Breathers, and just kind of go down that. But at the same time, you might just get some really good uh, s uh, spells, which are removal spells, some good draw spells, and have a, a fairly solid just burn, counter burn type of deck. And I think that's pretty cool as well. Simic is it was really good in the Midnight Hunt. It had this flashback stuff, and there was a lot of these flashback spells, but it was a lot less good in Crimson Vow. In Crimson Vow, it ended up being more of a ramp deck. I did see some stuff that worked quite well with Vile Spawn Spider, but usually the Vile Fort Spawn Spider was on the splash. Um, I do have some worries here that the Midnight Hunt stuff cared more about the flashback spells, so you've got the Root Coil Creeper, which you can get flashback spells back. Uh, flashback spells weren't in Crimson Vow, so it's one. It's a bit like what we're looking at um, with... Oh, I can't remember something we were talking about earlier. Oh, the Decayed stuff. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit like when you're looking at Decayed stuff, that the, um, the, the density of these flashback spells is going to be lower, <coughs> so Root Coil Creeper is going to be a little bit worse because of that. Um... The Vile Spawn Spider is still going to be quite as good, but if you're going to be doing things like you're going to be exiling some of your uh, cards to uh, flash them back, okay, the Vile Spawn Spider cares about creatures, I suppose, but there, there was a bit of a, a exiling things from the graveyard, so I'm not quite sure how these work together. I wouldn't quite say they're a non boat together, but I do think that the Simic decks will not be one of the better ones. I think it loses out a little bit just because of the, the archetypes don't quite work well together. Um, and so one cares about things in the graveyard, one cares about things not in the graveyard. Yes, you're self-milling, so you get stuff in the graveyard, but getting the flashback spells is going to be more difficult. However, uh, if you're doing the self-mill thing, having flashback spells is going to help, so this one is going to have, you have to wait and see. Um, I'm not expecting anything super exciting, but it could really surprise us. Celestia's so archetypes look like they kind of go quite well together. They're not an uh, inherent non-bow. <clears throat> uh, so in Midnight Hunt, we had Coven, which cared about having creatures of different powers. And in Crimson Vow, we had Training. So I've put uh, Parish Blade Training on here as well. So just you remember what Training is. When it attacks, you, if it attacks with something with greater power, you put a counter on it. And these could work quite well. It could be... you could. Manipulate training so you can get Coven and different things can give extra power. Uh, you also have Traveling Minister coming from Crimson Vow as well, which could help with the Coven stuff because it give that extra power where it needs to go at a particular time. And then you can definitely make sure you, you trigger in Coven. And I, I, I've got some good thoughts for this uh, archetype. I think it's going to be solid. I think it's going to be fine. I don't think it's going to be breaking any records or anything like that. But I think it's going to be fine to draft. And, um, you know, I wouldn't avoid this one if I was getting the right cards to go along with it. <clears throat> Boris is quite similar to the Slesnia. It's a kind of attacking uh, archetype as it usually is. In Midnight Hunt, it was all about, or kind of all about, uh, transferring between day and night. So there was a little bit of that going on. In Crimson Vow, it was kind of aggro vampires. There was a little bit of a attacking with two creatures at a time. Um, but it was just kind of like a weenies attacking deck as well. So these two seem to work quite well together. Um, the day and night stuff in Midnight Hunt was never a big thing. I think it was something's quite useful and it sometimes went off a little bit, but it was never, you could quite easily draft a red white deck which didn't really care about that and it would never transfer a knight and it would have been fine. Um, but, you know, you had some uh, strong uncommons and stuff. It was a deck which could get a trophy. Um, it, again, it was a bit like Celestia, yeah, that neither were breaking any records, but I'm expecting some quite good stuff to come again and I would happily draft red white if it came to me in the draft. Red Black, Rakdos, it was Vampire in both sets. In Crimson Vow, obviously, the big thing with Red Black was blood. You'll be getting fewer blood tokens and fewer things that care about blood, but they are still generally all vampires. And really, you can just power up the Red Black stuff from uh, Midnight Hunt. In Midnight Hunt, it was quite a good um, archetype. It was seen to be 
solid, but not the top three. I think the uh, the Esper colours, the black, white, blue, white, and white, black, were the best three in Midnight Hunt. Um, and this was probably about fourth. It was it was it was still solid, but it wasn't great. I'm expecting good things from this. I would again quite happily draft it. The a smaller amount of blood. I don't think it's gonna be a small amount of blood, but a smaller amount of blood that you're gonna get will. Uh, help with the smooth the format and give you a little bit of legs at the end of the, the form uh, end of the draft where you're digging for uh, anything that's not a land but yeah i think it's going to be quite solid there was some strong cards in both um midnight hunt cared about vampires was still gonna have vampires he had also cared about attacking and hitting the opponent for damage um but because of both vampires i think i'm going to be quite positive on this one also these are two format uh, these are two archetypes which don't really mesh together in uh, Crimson Vow, it's the life gain stuff in Midnight Hunt. It cared about the aristocraty sacrificing uh, creatures. So there was a few cards in Crimson Vow which created uh, like one ones and things like that, but not a huge amount. These don't inherently work well together. However, it was really good in um, Midnight Hunt and it was quite good in Crimson Vow. So the, I think it's still got some potential, but just be careful when you're drafting this that the synergies might not be as powerful as they were elsewhere. Azorius had. Two, well, it was both Disturb, but in Midnight Hunt, it was Disturb, and you got a creature on the front side, creature on the back side. In Crimson Vow, it was creature on the front side and enchantment on the back side, and there were some things which cared about enchantments in that set. Um, I think it's going to still play out in a kind of tempo-based deck that um, we can see. Yeah, it's still going to have, like, Lantern Bear and things like that. Um, and, you know, if you get your Devoted Graph Keeper and you manage to put uh, something which is going to be tapping down stuff for the opponent, you know, you're going to get this quite good tempo. Um, and, you know, I think there's, there's a quite a good attack and tempo deck that's there, which you could draft in both sets. So I think this is going to be quite a good one. I think this is one I'll be quite happy to draft. Um, and probably second strongest archetype in the set, I would say, <clears throat> because the, it was strong in both Midnight Hunt and Crimson Vow. And it's also strong in uh, that they don't kind of inherently go against each other. They still kind of work quite well together. They're both still disturbed. I think there were some things which cared if you disturbed a creature uh, or just cast something from a graveyard, and he's still going to be doing that. So I think you know, you're going to have some decent synergies there, and it was quite strong in both sets. But it won't be as strong as the last one, which is Demir. And this was the boogeyman of um, Midnight Hunt, even though it wasn't the best deck. It was, it was always was the best deck in Midnight Hunt. And it's, it's not as good in Crimson Vow because uh, we're looking at the Exploit. However, Exploit and Decayed Tokens work unbelievably well together. Uh, a card which I really liked from Crimson Vow in my first couple of drafts, I did um, Zombie Decks, I had three Article of Thravens. Article of Thraven with Decayed Tokens is unbelievable. And, you know, you could have your Skull Scab sacrificing um, some Decayed Tokens you're getting off your Dreadhorde... Uh, Dreadhorde. Uh, Diagraph Horde, sorry. Diagraph Horde, like, being able to really have the things to sacrifice with these exploit creatures is going to be so key. And, yeah, like, there's going to be some unbelievable things you can do. Just go full-on zombie. Um, I think you won't be getting as many decay tokens as you did in the original Midnight Hunt, as we've already talked about at length. But I'm excited for this. This is an archetype I want to draft because I want to really make use of these exploit cards and make sure that we are doing some quite spicy stuff with them. So I'm really looking forward to it. I think this would be my top uh, pick for the set, and it's what I would want to draft. So in summary, this is going to be a high power set. We're going to have two rares, four uncommons per pack at least, with a uh, foil in there as well, with only eight commons. So the uh, higher, the power is going to be quite high compared to what it was in the individual sets, and I think that makes it quite interesting, quite exciting. There are going to be some archetypes which are going to get stronger, so uh, and some that are going to get weaker. So the ones I get, think I get weaker are going to be Golgari, Simic, and Orzov. I think that they are the two that have a bit of a non-ball between the archetypes a little bit. But I think Demir really, really gains. I think Azorius arguably gains. I, I don't think it really gets weaker. I think they work quite well. But I think Demir really gains, especially if you compare it to the Crimson Vow archetype. I think it's going to really, really get stronger from there. So it's, uh, it's going to be a really interesting draft format. I'm looking forward to uh, giving it a go. If you want to follow us on social media, we are at PLDMTG at Twitter. And you can also give us a subscribe down below. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, really trying to get 250 by the time that 250 subscribers by the time um, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty comes out. So really looking forward to that. And thanks again. Catch you again soon.